What's up, everybody? It is your pastor, Tucker Mail, coming to you again from my living room to yours or wherever you are in this new digital version of church. And whether you've been uh, tuning in for a long time or this is your first time joining us, uh, thanks so much for allowing our church to carry on for uh, such a time as this. And let me also say to all of you, happy Palm Sunday. This is the day in our church calendar where we remember Jesus riding into Jerusalem at the praise and worship of the people waiting for the coming king and they're holding those palm branches and crying out Hosanna, hoping that he is the king that has come to save. And we're going to talk about that uh, today and we're going to do that by starting in Galatians chapter 4. If you have your Bible, please turn there. This is a verse that is in accordance to the way we're working through the Word and as it so often works out, it speaks perfectly to today, Palm Sunday, and also to where we're at in the climate of the world that we live in right now. Before we look at the verse of the morning, I want to do a quick wellness check. How's everybody feeling? We live in a strange time. Some people are, uh, are probably feeling under the weather or sick, as is the case often, so we hope that you're well. Others of us are living in a new normal where we are not necessarily feeling uh, any kind of sickness or symptoms or not feeling well, but we may be feeling something that after uh, about a week or two of, of sheltering in place and not going out as much, if you're like me and my family, you may be feeling the symptoms of cabin fever, also known as being stir crazy. So for those of you who haven't heard, I hope all of you have, we closed down our church campus. We are not holding services in our sanctuary. We're also not uh, conducting any of our staff meetings or pastoral meetings on campus, which means all of us, like many people right now, are working remotely. I am working remotely in a house that is not very large. Our kids share rooms and we have four little ones, ages six, four, two, and then a son that's under one. Um, so I'm starting to feel that that press of cabin fever. Uh, look what the definition for stir crazy is. It is being psychologically disturbed, especially as a result of being confined or imprisoned. Do you relate to that definition yet? Here it is used in a sentence. She'd be in danger of going stir crazy if she had to look at the same four faces any longer. Excuse me, the same four walls any longer, but you can see how easily it can turn into the same four faces, at least in, in my example. So the days have been long and it's been exciting to be home more, but it's also uh, been challenging at times to try to find space to find my normal rhythm for sermon writing, and prayer and encouragement. Um, so as one of the compromises of our household, we, we typically monitor screen time pretty closely. This particular week, we opened up the floodgates just a little bit. And we're allowing our, our girls uh, to, to tune in to a television program once per day. And the key for me, my life pro tip to those of you who are opening up those gates a little bit to find something that you can all agree on. We do not have the mental space to have a bunch of noise playing from a kid's show that is too much. So the, the compromise we found in our household, the, the place that our Venn diagrams perfectly overlapped was a show from the 1960s called Flipper. It's about a boy and his brother who have a pet dolphin and this dolphin is, it, it, it's, it's something that I like because he's a dolphin that always wants to help. He's a dolphin that has like a capacity for kindness to help those in need and, and the boys are always down for adventure. So we've really enjoyed the show in our household, uh, but I, I, I hesitate to recommend it for your household because of one of the side effects, at least for my daughters, is that they are now speaking in a dolphin language throughout my whole house. They're all doing that high-pitched cackle. Two of the girls have taken on the personality of mom dolphin and baby dolphin, and then one of my daughters is pretending to be a mermaid all the time, but she speaks dolphin, so they, all three of them are doing a very high-pitched cackle that I will not repeat. 
All of that to say cabin fever is pressing and it's been rainy outside so they've been indoors more and then yesterday we had an earthquake so I'm thinking maybe they should be outdoors more in case the house collapse and as you can see I say that all very casually because we just expect these things these days don't we? Um, I hope that your family and your atmosphere and your space is well but I would not be surprised as we do our weekly wellness check for the soul and for the household that you belong to if you're feeling a little tinge of cabin fever. Now here's the good news and here's why I mention any of this. As you think about how to break cabin fever, in the articles I was reading there's one theme that continually comes up. The way that you get through these, these psychological disturbances that make you feel like uh, the walls are closing in on you is to fix your attention attention on something to be excited about. Whether that is the excitement of finishing a puzzle, whether that is the excitement of drawing and painting a picture like it is for my kids, whether that's the excitement of your next delicious meal and the smells that are coming out of the oven, or more importantly, the excitement of what happens when all of this comes to its grand conclusion. That is the excitement that will get you through whatever season of being stir crazy you find yourself in is the excitement of what you do when winter turns into summer. The excitement of the vacation maybe that you book very cheap uh, to the, when that day finally comes and you can get out with your friends and family to a far off destination and enjoy each other again. Or ultimately the excitement of what God is doing in our world through all of this. And that is exactly what we find in Galatians chapter 4, that God has intervened into human history before in a moment when the people of God were feeling stir crazy, were feeling the, the, the pressing of the world around them, wondering when God was going to move again. And it says in Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 5, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Is there any greater picture of the exciting expectation than of an orphan child waiting for the day when their parents, their new father and their new mother will finally come to rescue them. That is the picture that we find in God sending his son into the world to redeem all of the children of God who are waiting for redemption. And God sent his son into the world and we remember the details of that on Palm Sunday. And that's really what we're going to study this morning. And here's three things that I find as reasons to be excited as we study the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday and as we consider the world that we live in, the expectation that we have for what God is doing in the midst of our cabin fever. Three things. God has a plan. God's plan is always better than our plans. And God's plan will prevail. We start by looking at Matthew chapter 21 to, to realize that God has a plan. Matthew chapter 21 starting in verse 1 says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. And he's going to send them on a mission to get the donkey that he's going to ride into town on. And I want you to consider the details of the plan. It says, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And then he says, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. Jesus is essentially telling them to borrow a donkey unannounced. If anyone asks, here's the exact thing you say. And when you say that, here is what they will give you. They will let you have it and you'll bring it to me. It says the disciples did everything he said and it all worked. 
Why is this important? Because Jesus is giving them the details of a plan that is going to work step by step. And each one of them have these little signposts to remind the disciples and to remind us that Jesus is in absolute control. He knows where the donkey is. He knows how they're going to get it. He knows what they should say if anyone asks and what they say will work. He gives Other ways for detailed plans that have some obscure details in them to show the disciples that Jesus is in absolute control. In Luke chapter 22, we get another moment where Jesus is going to send some disciples on a mission. This is happening now during that Holy Week moment of the Passover. And he sends his disciples to go find the upper room to prepare the feast. And how does he do it? How do they find the upper room? They look for a person carrying a pot of water on their head. They'll take them right to the the innkeeper. And then Jesus says, this is exactly what you say to the innkeeper. And this is what he'll say to you. And they're going to get the room. Why are these obscure details inserted? Again, reminders that Jesus is telling his disciples, listen to me and know that I am control. And here is why this is so important for us. Because sometimes the plans of God do not always seem like they are happening in an obvious and uh, logical way to us. In fact, we live in a time right now where the fullness of time and whatever God is preparing, we don't necessarily have the exact answers as to how the plan is working. And if you don't have logical answers that you can see, you may be tempted to think that the plan is breaking or the plan is not happening at all. And it's hard to be excited about a plan that you don't see fully functioning around you. This is exactly what happens from the moment of the triumphal entry to what will be just a few days later, Good Friday. Because the triumphal entry is a plan that makes sense to us. Jesus is riding in. The people are crowning him Messiah and begging him to save their nation. And he receives their praise. And then what happens? Well, What happens next is something that's very confusing to the disciples and to the readers of the story and to the people that are watching the coming Messiah that they hoped would come to restore their kingdom. And yet it's not at all surprising to Jesus because he said the surprising parts of the story that make the plan seem like they're breaking were all there from the beginning. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 20 as he's preparing his disciples to come to Jerusalem with him. He says, behold... Verse 18, Matthew 20, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. As he comes into the triumphal entry, he's coming with the knowledge and the foresight to know how this plan is going to play out. And the disciples will be very confused by this. In fact, that word, he will be betrayed, is very important because in the moment of the upper room last supper feast, he looks at his disciples and he says, you will Betray me. One of you will betray me, speaking of Judas. And then he says, when the shepherd is struck, all of the sheep were scattered, scatter, speaking of all of their betrayal. And then Peter, being the bold disciple, like some of us are, thinking, I'll never give up. I'll never betray the Lord. I will never stop following. Says, not me, Lord. I will die with you. And what does Jesus say? Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Knowing that every step along the way, the plan was being fulfilled, even at times when it seemed like the plan was breaking, Jesus was in control. God has a plan. And the other aspect of this that we're so hopeful in for the triumphal entry and our time, it says in verse 4 of Matthew 21, all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. And then the gospel writer quotes the prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling. It comes from Zechariah. He says, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on on a donkey. This prophecy was given by the prophet of God through the inspiration of the Spirit to give us an understanding that God is in full control. It would take 500 years for the fullness of time of that prophecy to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ, but it is a reminder that God has a plan, that God is in control, and that God knows the exact perfect time to fulfill his prophecy for his people. And I'm encouraged by that because we live in a time where we need God to remind us time and time again, I have a plan and I'm in control. And 
What are the plans of God right now? Well, one of them that I'm so encouraged by, that I hope you as a believer are encouraged by, and that you as someone who is looking to God to reveal His heart in all of the circumstances that surround us, one of the promises of God that I believe we can cling to right now is, re- is found in 2 Peter chapter 3. When it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. One of the promises of God that we can see as a reminder of our day for such a time as this, in the fullness of time, God sees it fit to remind us that he is not slack for his promises, but the fullness of time, he uses these kind of things to fulfill his desire that all would come to know him, that many would see this as a reason to no longer look into the, the, the securities of our world or the plans of our lives or the promises of our own desires or our own future hopes and dreams, but this is a time to look to the God of creation who uses all things as a way to draw people to himself, desiring that None should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And then it goes on to say this. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That is a promise of God that will be fulfilled in the fullness of time that we now are waiting for. This is part of our cabin fever. We, as believers in God, as people who are waiting with expectation to see what God is going to do, realize that one of His promises is that He is going to cleanse the fallen nature of this world, that He will use this to bring people to His marvelous light and plan for salvation through His Son who came to to us in peace on a donkey to die for our sins, that none would perish, but all would come to know his power to save and his loving kindness. And now I speak to those of you who are not believers. This is your time as you feel the, the anxiousness and you look for that thing to hang your expectations and your hopes on. This is the promise of God. This world is perishing. Look around. There's no surprise now. The news is reminding you. Your circumstances are probably reminding you. This world is not built to last forever. It will pass away. And in the fullness of time, God will come to restore his kingdom of everlasting peace and love. And we are all being called to remember that God has a plan and it is the redemption of the world. And that brings us to the second reminder of the triumphal entry, that God's plan is better. The expectation of the people was that the Messiah would come to set them free and to save them. And we get a a picture of that as the procession now, now reaches to the people who were so excited to see Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. And they're waiting for him. And Matthew chapter 21 verse 9 says, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is another moment where scripture is being fulfilled on the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. That's Psalm 118, a messianic psalm for the people to to praise Jesus with. He receives their praise, accepting the title of the Messiah. And the interesting portion of this particular psalm is that they're saying Hosanna, which, which most easily translates to the words, save us. Come on your, your processional and march into Jerusalem and restore our kingdom. They wanted Jesus to meet the expectations that they had for the Messiah to be the next great ruler and final ruler of Israel. And we get a preview as to that expectation as the disciples themselves were marching with Jesus towards Jerusalem. They started to argue who would be the greatest in his kingdom, where they would sit at the cabinet, who would be his number two, who would be his number three. And Jesus says, you have it all backwards because he didn't come to be served as a typical king. He came to serve. 
And one of the ways that their expectations would not be met, that their plans for salvation did not go far enough, is seen in how Jesus now makes his first move after receiving the title of Messiah as given to them through the fulfillment of prophecy in Psalm 118. It says in verse 10, And we had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God, and he drove out all the centurion soldiers from Rome, No. The tax collectors who were there to to represent the occupying forces, pulling the money out of the citizens of Jerusalem to send back to the capital? Nope. Was it the the Roman citizens were living as the the first class citizens and and the Jewish citizens as second? No, he didn't drive out any of the Romans. It says that he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He, he was driving out the people in positions of power at the temple. And this is why his enemies were not the, the Romans, but the Pharisees. He came not to restore a political kingdom, but to restore the house of God from a house that had turned into a den of thieves and turn it into a place of prayer. As Jesus says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he restores the proper worship of God into the heart of the temple. And the blind and the lame came to him and into the temple and he healed all of them. And this is a reminder to us as we remember what Jesus accomplished on Palm Sunday and what kind of Jesus, what kind of king Jesus came to be, his plans are greater than our plans. He did not come to restore the position of power for one Middle Eastern country, the nation of Israel, the capital city of Jerusalem, and set his disciples to reign and rule in that limited capacity. He came to restore the hearts and minds of the entire world back into what we were created to be, which is worshipers and reflections of God, our creator who we were made in the image of. This is the salvation that Jesus came to bring. And this is a much greater Hosanna moment than anyone in that, in that crowd was imagining. And it's true of our lives as well. We all have our Hosanna moments. We have those moments when we cry out, Lord, save us. In fact, if you looked at a, at a graph of my life, it would kind of look like this where I'm doing pretty well. And then something happens and I yell, Hosanna. And, and I say, God, save me. And then he restores me or he brings me onto solid ground. And, and then he, my life goes well again. And, and my, my worship is sometimes the most intense just because I need God to help me out again. And oftentimes, if you're like me, When we say Hosanna, when we say God save us, we're telling them how to do it. We're we're saying, get the Romans out of our lives. We're saying, get the tax collectors out of our lives. We're saying, uh, let us be restored into the way things usually were. And in this season of our world, we've got to be so careful not to tell God how to save us because his plans are better. He wasn't saving a nation. He was saving a world. He wasn't setting up 12 disciples. He was making a world full of Holy Spirit indwelled people to be his hands and feet in a movement that reached so far beyond what anyone could have imagined. And in our lives now, we could be tempted to say, save us, restore life as normal. Let me go back to the church that I love and that I can't wait to go back to things as usual. But I believe as we study the plans of God, he's always doing greater things than we realize. His redemption is always bigger than we think. And I'm mindful of that in in my own life. It reminds me of a C.S. Lewis quote. C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity, Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. Now, at first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks and the roof and so on. You knew those jobs needed to be done, so so you're not surprised at all. But then he starts knocking the house about in ways that hurt. And they don't seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is this. He is building 
quite a different house from the one you thought of throwing on a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace and he is building a palace he intends to live in himself. And that is the, the journey of salvation that all of us are on. We come to those rock bottom Hosanna moments. We say, save us from this jail, save us from this addiction, save me from this dead end. And God will use those moments to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you ever thought to ever ask for salvation in. He's going to make you a brand new creation. He's going to use your life in ways you never believed were possible. And in the same way that happens from glory to glory in your own life that is happening in our world right now. So many people are crying out for a salvation to restore the old or to bring back the normal. And God has greater plans still. Wherever there is evil, God has greater plans of redemption. Wherever there is confusion, God has greater plans for revelation. And I believe what is happening in the church and in the world is that people are asking God to save them and he will take their inch and he will give them a mile. And he will save the church, not just by taking us back to business as usual, but by using this time where we're in every person's living room who has the the interest to tune in to the message of God to bring a whole new harvest of people who would have never stepped foot into a building, but would be willing to turn on a a live streaming service. And he's going to do a brand new thing in our world. And as you all pray through whatever God is teaching you to trust in him for this season, he wants to do more than you can think to ask. He wants to do more than just save your normal routine and save your normal budget and save your normal flow of life. He wants to use this as a way to redeem things that you have not even thought of yet, to redeem family members, to redeem friends, to bring more, uh, more salvation into our churches and to give us a broader reach into our families. Let God be the God who has a better plan than we do. May we be reminded on the triumphal entry of the Palm Sunday that we celebrate today that the disciples wanted Jesus to be a king and he was a king that wore a crown of thorns to take on the sin of the world that he could conquer it once and for all. And this brings us to the final thing to find great expectation and excitement in. Not only does God have a plan, not only is God's plan better than ours, but God's plan will prevail. In Luke chapter 19, we get another gospel writer's perspective on the triumphal entry, and it adds a very important detail to encourage us that God's plan is unstoppable. Right after the crowds have sung Psalm 118, over Jesus. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, Verse 39 tells us of the reaction of the Pharisees, and it's really important. They say this, some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Meaning what you're doing isn't right. You you shouldn't absorb the title of Messiah. They, They rejected Jesus and they wanted him to stop the worship, stop the praise, stop the parade. And what does Jesus say? And he answered to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Jesus says this is an unstoppable moment of worship. And there are some different ways that you can interpret what Jesus is saying. In one moment, Jesus says, listen, uh, I can raise up sons of Abraham out of stones. So you better be careful if you rely too much on your heritage. There's other commentators that say this is a picture of all of the disciples that Jesus will raise up as the movement of Christ spreads through the world, turning non-believers' hard hearts of stone into soft hearts of new creation ambassadors for Christ. And he really does raise up disciples from the stony hearts that all of us once had. But maybe my favorite example or a commentator view on this is that truly the stone does proclaim the power of God in the unstoppable plan specifically for something that we are going to celebrate with worship that we so desperately need right now in the story of the unstoppable plan of God seen in the empty tomb. 
In Luke chapter 24, we get this picture of the confusion that is surrounding the death of Christ because he has not yet risen and shown that the plan is moving forward. And the first ones to the tomb on that early Easter morning were these women. They come with spices to to take care of the, the dead body of Christ. And then it says, Luke chapter 24, verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the entrance of the tomb. And in that very moment, the stone is crying out to the entire world that the plan of God cannot be stopped and will always prevail because death could not hold him down. He overcame sin and death itself to usher in a brand new creation of Christ that anyone who believes in him would not perish, would not die forever, but would have everlasting life, would all be able to identify with the stone that covered the entrance of a tomb, rolled away to proclaim the power of God, that he cannot be stopped, and that in him is life itself, and we have life in his name. God plan won't be stopped. It wasn't stopped on the first Easter and it isn't stopped now. And God is using all of these circumstances to remind his people that when we align with the movement of God in our life, when we trust in the plans of God to take chaos under control and use it for his glory, we have nothing to be afraid about. We have nothing to worry about because if God's plans prevail and we're the people of God, then we prevail. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the resounding answer is nobody. And so let me just bring this sermon full circle. When we talk about the cabin fever and the way that we can get through the seasons where it feels like the walls are pressing in on us and we cannot wait to see what's on the other side, Let me remind you of the eager expectation that you wait for that goes beyond leaving your house and returning to life as normal and getting back to church and into a normal routine. Those things will come as God sees fit in his perfect timing. But that will not end the groaning that that all of us feel that is only being amplified right now. Here's what we are all actually groaning for. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. And it says we grow weary. We get cabin fever. We get stir crazy in our current body. And we long to put on our heavenly body. It then goes on to say that God himself has prepared us this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his spirit. Here's what we really long for in this time. We, we think maybe that our salvation moment is going to come in the form of vaccine. It's going to come in the form of flattening the curve. Or it's going to come in the form of us leaving and going back to life as normal. All those things will be blessings from God. But the ultimate reality is that we long for something that is greater than this world has to offer. We are actually feeling the stir crazy because we still live in a temporal fallen world, in temporal fallen bodies, and we long for the hope of heaven to be realized. And that is something that God in this very moment is preparing for the fullness of time. When he sees it fit, when the last person has repented that is going to come into his kingdom, when all of us are finally prepared with hearts of worship, it is then and only then that God who is preparing that place for us now will return in the fullness of his glory and the stirring that we feel now, the temporary let's get out of our house, will only be fulfilled when we are in the presence of God once and for all of eternity. So may we hold on to that hope. May God remind us in this time that yes, God has a plan and his plans are greater and his plans will prevail.